Hi everyone, um, it is five o'clock Eastern time and, and uh, my name is Dr. Jess Callahan and I'm the psychiatric uh, mental health nurse practitioner uh, department program chair, department chair. And um, welcome to our, our Q&A session this afternoon on, uh, on the psychiatric mental health program specialty at Frontier Nursing University. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce um, some of our staff that are with us today. And um, so our staff, our admissions team, and our clinical placement team, can you please introduce yourselves? Hi there, my name is Jamie Wheeler, and I'm one of the clinical advisors here. And I'm sure we'll explain my role later, but happy to be here and uh, answer any questions for you. Thanks so much. And of course, we have our wonderful marketing team that, that put this together, though. So, so thank you, uh, Rosalie and, and Quincy. Appreciate all your hard work. Okay, next slide. Thank you. All right, so who are we? Um, well, Frontier Nursing University is a very unique place in, the, in that uh, it is essentially, um, you know, kind of the birth, birthplace of nursing midwifery here in the, in the United States. Um, and also had the also um, started the very first uh, family nurse practitioner program. And so um, our mission is really to provide accessible nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner uh, education to prepare competent entrepreneurial, ethical and compassionate leaders um, in primary care to serve all individuals with an emphasis on women, women and families in diverse and underserved rural and underserved populations. Something we take very, very seriously here at Frontier. Uh, many of uh, many of us that are in clinical practice are practicing in in rural and underserved communities, and it's really kind of at the heart of who we are as Frontier. And we're more than just a, we're more than just an online university, and you're going to see that um, uh, today our distance education program. And hopefully, this uh, presentation shows you that. Okay, next slide. All right. So um, one of the things that that's really uh, separates us from many other distance education programs is, is our strong sense of community and, uh, and, and our ability to establish that strong sense of community uh, with, with students that aren't in, a, in an in-person classroom on a regular basis, but rather in a, in a virtual environment. And it really starts with our culture of caring. Our culture of caring uh, is foundational to, to who we are and what we believe um, at, at Frontier. And it, it revolves around um, uh, mutual respect, uh, professionalism, um, um, and 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 things along you know along those lines. So um, very very important to who who we are, and um, we really try to create a sense of community in your classroom. Um, because we're a distance education program, you do get to study from uh, from home and work from home. Um, but we do want folks to come on campus, and we have two on campus requirements. It's again a little bit different than some of the other uh, other distance education programs that are out there. And the first time you come on campus is right before you start the program. Our campus is in Versailles, Kentucky, and for those of you that that don't know, that's uh, uh, very close to Lexington, Kentucky, um, and um, and we're about, about 12 to 15 minutes away from the airport. Uh, we've been on our campus now uh, a little over uh, two full years, and um, we're really excited about our new campus. Um, and there's there's we have lots of amenities on campus, and um, it's really set up to support you as students in, in your in your uh, in your educational journey. And so. Um, so you come to um, our orientation and we have some workshops uh, to get you prepared for, um, for, starting, you know, for starting at Frontier and getting going and things that you need to be successful and, and those sorts of things. And it starts off with once you're admitted to Frontier, um, you, um, you will sign up for a, a Frontier bound date and come to uh, our orientation. And one of the things that's important to us is we're not the type of program that um, is looking to, you know, looking to get rid of people. So if you're accepted, it means that you were, uh, you, you met all of our admission requirements and we really, really, truly want you to be successful. And, and coming to Frontier Bound is the start of that success because you get to see all of the support um, uh, mechanisms in place from faculty to staff that we have to make sure that your, your educational journey is as smooth as it can be. Um, and that you're successful and that you ultimately graduate. 
Um, and then we have another on-campus requirement that's kind of at the midpoint of your curriculum called clinical bound. And you come on campus after you complete all of your coursework and you're getting ready to start the clinical portion of the curriculum. And it's an opportunity for you to work with faculty um, on a lot of different skills and it gives us an opportunity to assess um, gives us an opportunity to assess what you've learned in the clinical environment or in the didactic portion and apply it in a safe way before you go out and start your clinical rotations with uh, with clinical preceptors. So uh, we have great programming for clinical bound. Uh, our, it's probably one of the highest rated courses that we have at Frontier. Um, students really, really enjoy the immersive clinical experience uh, when they when they come on campus. So again, just to just to highlight, there's two on campus requirements, one at the beginning, um, and then one about midway midway through the curriculum. Okay, next slide. All right, um, so a little bit of history of, about the Psych NP. Um, so Dr. Hildegard Peplau uh, was, was really kind of the first, um, you know, advanced practice psych nurse and, and, she's, and she um, started the clinical nurse specialist program. The clinical nurse specialist program was founded to really uh, work in inpatient facilities and um, provide education to nurses on how to care for patients with psychiatric issues. Um, and, 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 and not just education, but also consultation. So right at the bedside, um, what are some interventions that you can do to support mental health patients? And then, and then that sort of evolved into um, doing consults on medical units and non-psychiatric units and managing uh, patients with comorbid mental health issues. And then it evolved into uh, clinical nurse specialists providing psychotherapy and then eventually prescribing medications. Their educational preparation was much different than the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Um, and so we transitioned to the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner officially uh, in about 2007. Um, and so most very, there's no schools that offer the clinical nurse specialist anymore. Uh, the last school that offered it retired it in 2000, uh, 2007. So um, we have psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners in all 50 states and some uh, foreign countries. And um, it's really a role that is very, very unique uh, to advanced practice nursing because we can really perform our duties within our specialty in many, many varieties of settings. Okay, next slide. All right, so what are some of our achievements at FNU? Well, we have over 80 years of experience in graduate uh, uh, nursing and midwifery education. Uh, we have students in every single state. Uh, we currently have more than 2,500 students and, 80, and over 8,000 graduates. The Psych and Mental Health Program started in uh, 2017, and, um, and, and it's just continued to grow. Um, it started out with about four faculty and, and 18 students, and now we're up to over 30 faculty and 650 students in our program. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so with that number of students, it was very important to me to, um, to, for us to, to have a, a solid program that wasn't like a program that you could finish in nine months and, and come out. When you come to our program, you're going to be ready for practice. Our, our, our program teaches you to become a specialist in uh, advanced practice psychiatric nursing. And the American Nurses Credentialing Center is the only board certifying uh, body in the United States. And our, our overall exam pass rates for 2021 um, are, are 93%. The ANCC pass rates are 83%. And then our graduates are uh, exceeding uh, all three domains of the exam by at least 10 percentage points. Um, and this is, this is, uh, puts us in the, in the top 10 of programs in the country in terms of, um, in terms of, um, uh, having this number of students and having, and being this successful on the board certification pass rate, you have to pass the national board certification pass rate or pass, uh, boards before you can, uh, become a, before you can get licensed in your individual states. Um, is an advanced practice nurse. So this is kind of that first prerequisite. Now our program doesn't teach to the exam, but our program teaches you everything that you need to do to be successful on the, on the exam. And I wanna call attention to this picture. Um, uh, the person in the middle is one of our new faculty members. She graduated uh, back in 2019, has got some uh, clinical experience um, and, and has just recently joined our team this month as a clinical faculty. And we're very, very excited 
uh, uh, to have her on our on our team. So um, our students are getting jobs. They're being they're, they're successful out there. And I hear all the time from clinical preceptors that if they have a choice of a frontier student or a student from another university. They're going to hands down take the frontier student because they know what the frontier student brings to the table and they know that they're going to be ready to, to start their clinical rotations um, during um, you know, when, when they get to that portion of the curriculum. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so student support. Well, we have a lot of different resources for student support that's much different than many other universities. And the first is, I think, our academic advising and clinical advising team. In a lot of places, the faculty are actually academic advisors, and it makes it difficult to, to provide support to students because many of us are teaching in courses and teaching in multiple courses. And so one of the things that's different here about Frontier is that, um, that we have a dedicated academic advising team that's independent of the faculty that's here to support you through your academic journey. They, you will meet with them and they'll set up your uh, what courses to register, how long your curriculum is going to be, all of those uh, sorts of things. And then the other unique thing that we have is our clinical advising team. And, and, um, and Jamie's part of that team. And that team is here dedicated to help support you with clinical placement um, and, and finding clinical placement. And because we have grown significantly and we're in all 50 states, um, we have partnerships and agreements with uh, many sites across the country and our clinical advising team is here uh, to support you uh, with clinical placement. Now, we don't place you clinically. You, you have to drive that train, but we have uh, a lot of support services in place um, to help you uh, find clinical placement. In fact, when you come to Frontier Bound, if admitted to our program, uh, then you'll have a whole session and get to meet the clinical advising team and, and uh, talk about uh, you know, clinical placement and those sorts of things. Um, and then we have online student mentoring groups. Um, we have uh, tutoring. Our financial aid and scholarships team is here to, um, is here to help and, and, um, and you know, help you with financial aid needs and process financial aid and those sorts of things. And I think we probably have one of the best online services, library services in the country. Uh, great team of staff there that are here to support students with their, um, you know, with their, with their library needs and research needs. And one of the things that we're very, very proud of is um, we continue to win um, national awards for our efforts with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have a we have an active diversity uh, impact program uh, that's that student, faculty, and staff based, and um, lots of different things that we're doing in this area um, to ensure that we are on our way to being uh, achieving our goals of being an anti-racist university. Um, and then, lastly, we also have our regional clinical faculty, and our regional clinical faculty are there to kind of be your person while you are. Um, in the clinical portion of the curriculum. They're gonna sign off on your clinical sites. If there's any issues with preceptors, they're gonna address that. You're gonna meet with those clinical uh, faculty on a regular basis during the clinical portion of the curriculum. They're gonna grade your assignments. And um, again, that's something that's also unique to, uh, to Frontier as well. Um, and your, your clinical uh, faculty will come do site visits and some of the clinical sites that you're at and meet with your preceptors. Um, so you can see we have a very, very robust support system in place. Uh, to help uh, ensure that students are, are successful, again, in their educational journey here at Frontier. Okay, next slide, please. Student scholarships. Um, so we've, last year we awarded over $700,000 in scholarships. There's multiple scholarship opportunities here at Frontier. Our award cycles are uh, spring and, and fall term. Uh, you have to have completed, though, a minimum of 24 credits with Frontier. So that's about eight courses. Um, and then you have to have a minimum uh, GPA of 3.25 or higher. And scholarships uh, vary in different, you know, different amounts. Now, uh, for those of you that are working in rural and underserved communities, uh, the Health Resources Service Administration, or HRSA, uh, provides nurse course scholarships to students that are working in those areas um, that, that you can also uh, apply for. And... Um, and and get those are separate from the university, um, but these uh, but these particular scholarships that we have here are through our student support uh, or through our through our financial aid and scholarships department and are available uh, for frontier students. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, clinical outreach and placement. We've already kind of talked about that, and 
Uh, Jamie, can I just give you a, a, a minute or two to talk about your office and what sure. those what, what you all support? So like just said, my name is Jamie Wheeler. I'm one of the clinical advisors here at Frontier. And our work with you starts before the first day of class because we will meet you at Frontier Bound um, where we have a whole session about navigating the search process. Uh, one of the main things we will do is teach you about the resources. And one of those main resources you will be using is the community map. This is essentially a Frontier database that you will have access to after or when Frontier Bound begins. You'll be able to look in there to see where we've had past placements in your area. You are not limited to our community map, but basically it has over 10,000 sites, over 10,000 preceptors, and that's a resource available to you. Um, our team puts on um, group advising sessions each term, webinars, um, if you'd rather meet one-on-one -on -one with us, we're happy to meet with you one on one. We know everyone has unique situations and different challenges. So we we work for you and uh, um, we're happy to troubleshoot with you and, um, you know, dive into your unique situation. Um, but we teach you how to use the resources and uh, I look forward to working with you. So if you have any questions, um, put them in the chat and I'll also list my email address there if you have something you'd like to ask me later. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jamie. And one of the things that I forgot to mention about our faculty that also makes us unique is almost every single one of us are in clinical practice to include me. So we're walking the same road that you all are, are walking, or we walk that road and, and we're all in clinical practice. Um, I work with um, uh, multiple federal qualified, federally qualified and rural health centers and, um, and, our, and many of our faculty do the, the same thing. And the other thing is, is that because we have um, you know, such a, a diverse faculty with, a, with a, you know, varying experiences, Many of our faculty are, are, are experts in their particular subspecialties. And so if there's something in sight that you're interested in doing um, that's, that, that's kind of subspecialized, for example, like children and adolescents or substance use disorders or those sorts of things, uh, we have a faculty member that's, we have faculty that are on, on staff that are uh, experts in those particular areas. So again, something that's unique from many other universities. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so some of our national recognition um, in, in terms of, um, um, you know, across the, across the board, I mentioned in the middle there, um, the Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award. I believe that's the fourth time that we've won that award uh, in 2021. And then in 2022, we were ranked the top online MSN program um, in the country. And um, we, received, we also received the uh, international award for uh, distance learning uh, ed education. Um, and one of the cool things too that you have to think about in terms of your, your, uh, your, your journey and where you would like to go to school is how do they treat the staff and faculty? And we're very excited to say that we've won um, uh, the, the, uh, another uh, 20, we won another great colleges to work for uh, award. Again, I believe this is our second or third award in the last two years. Um, and so I think that that speaks to the culture that we have at Frontier uh, amongst the faculty and staff and, and um, you know, how, how much we uh, truly embrace our organization, uh, which translates to you all as well, because we understand that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our students. Um, so uh, I just wanted to call attention to that as well. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what are our degree options here at, at Frontier? Well, for the program, specific tracks uh, for psych mental health. We have our MSN program, uh, which is designed for, uh, for RNs uh, that want to become an advanced practice nurse. Um, and then we have our postgraduate certificate program that's designed for uh, nurse practitioners and nurse midwives. Um, and if you're others, if you have a postgraduate certificate in another practice area besides, um, besides nurse midwifery or nurse practitioner, um, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for us to put you into this particular program because there's national education requirements that are needed uh, to fit into this. Now, no worries. If you're a different specialty like nurse anesthesia or something along those lines and you're a postgraduate certificate student, we'll, we'll offer you the courses. You just won't be able to jump right into the management courses because you have to have 
um, three courses that are part of the um, that, that are part of the, the national requirement to be eligible for board, uh, board certification. And then we have our, our DNP program, which is our Doctor of Nursing Practice program. You cannot do two programs at the same time at Frontier currently, uh, but we do find that many of our students uh, complete their MSN or postgraduate certificate and then go into our DNP program. And currently we have a direct admission process into our um, a DNP program. And there's an opportunity for MSN students to take uh, some of the DNP courses while they're in the MSN to decrease their credit workload later on uh, as they as they uh, you know move into the DNP for our program. Um, our we're on a term system. We have eleven weeks between terms with two week breaks in between, with the exception of during the clinical portion of the program. We really don't subscribe to this during the clinical portion of the program, except for registration purposes only. Because the last thing we'd want to do is to say, "Oh, it's coming up to the end of the term. You have to stop your clinical rotations." You know, when you've worked hard to secure a priest, we're trying to get clinical hours done. Um, but for the for the didactic portion of the curriculum, there's there's two weeks uh, two week breaks in between. Um, each terms. And so we also have different term uh, time frame options for completing the degree. Absolute soonest that an MSN can complete the degree is in 24 months or two years. The absolute soonest that a postgraduate certificate student can complete the degree is 16 months. So that's going to be pushing really close. And then our DNP uh, is 18 months. Most of our students, most of our MSN students finish in about uh, 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 two years, three months to two years, six months. Most of our DNP students finish in about uh, months. So um, those are the time frames that we have in terms of what the programs of study look like. Now, you don't have to complete it in that time frame. If you have things that come up and you need to take time off school, we can accommodate that. Uh, we have a kind of a five year limit on, from your first day in enrollment when you need to complete the program. Uh, but we have we have options. And um, and as you if you're accepted to the university, uh, when you come to Frontier Bound, you can uh, we can tailor your program of study to meet your needs. and You'll be able to talk with the folks. Uh, on, on what that looks like. But this is just to give you kind of a general overview of, of what the, the time frame uh, looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, our MSN admissions criteria, you have to be an RN with the current uh, active unencumbered license. You can have a bachelor's degree in any uh, field, uh, 2.8 cumulative uh, GPA, and then be in good academic standing prior to your uh, educational work, and then have at least one year of RN experience. You don't necessarily need to have psychiatric nursing experience, although I'll say psych is everywhere, and I think most of you would agree, um, but it's not a requirement that you have worked on an inpatient psych unit uh, to, be, to be one of our, our students. You just need to have one year of RN experience. Okay, next slide. Our postgraduate certificate students, this is a list of the nurse practitioners that I was kind of talking about earlier um, that are eligible for our postgraduate certificate admissions criteria. If you're an advanced practice nurse and you don't fall into this area, um, then um, we'll take a, you know, then we've, we will take a look at your transcripts and tell you what you need to take. Now, there are occasionally some folks that are on this list that, that do not have uh, the required courses across the lifespan uh, to be eligible for uh, board certification upon graduation. And so upon uh, admissions, your admissions counselor, we will review your transcripts, make sure that you have everything that you need. Um, our admissions committee will review your transcripts. And if you don't meet the criteria for um, um, the, the three courses that are across the lifespan, then we will let you know, and you'll have to take those courses in addition to um, the, the specialty program of study. Most of the time it occurs with our midwives, women's health and pediatric nurse practitioner colleagues uh, and neonatal nurse practitioner colleagues. Um, but again, we'll take a review of that. We'll take a look at what you've got and, um, and go from there. So it potentially, if you don't have those courses that potentially uh, would add uh, three courses to your program of study. And that's not unique to Frontier. That is, that is a national requirement. That, uh, that you have those courses. So no matter what university you go to, if they don't tell you that, they're not being transparent with you because you're not gonna be eligible uh, for board certification unless you have uh, those three uh, specific lifespan uh, courses on your transcripts, okay? All right, next slide. All right, our application deadline. Um, um, so tomorrow is our application deadline. Uh, for winter term. Uh, coursework would begin on January the 7th. The Frontier Bound would occur uh, in late November, uh, early December. We have run multiple uh, Frontier Bounds. Um, we have an easy application process. 
Um, and uh, we, we do do door rolling admissions. So just because everything shuts down tomorrow for fall term, um, you'll or for to start in winter term, our applications will be opening up very soon for the spring term start. Um, and as you can see, uh, tuition is very affordable here at $646 a credit hour. Um, you know, I've seen schools that are three and four times that. So uh, that's one of the other benefits here at Frontiers. We're a private nonprofit university. And, uh, and our goal is to try to keep, um, you know, tuition is reasonably priced and, and affordable uh, because we, we know that many of you have other obligations and, um, and, and we want to, you know, we want to, like I said, try to keep things as affordable as we can based off current market uh, conditions. So uh, next slide. All right, our clinical experiences, um, like I said, our curriculum is structured uh, very much like a SOAP note. For those of you that, that, uh, that are in clinical practice, and a SOAP note is a subjective uh, objective assessment and plan note. And so uh, the way our didactic curriculum is structured is, is we, we teach you the S, O, and the A in, the first, in, the, when you're in our first set of uh, site courses. We teach you the P in our second set of site courses, and then you put everything together in, your, in the third set of site courses before coming to Clinical Bound. Um, our students, our MSN students, are required to have at least 675 clinical hours. Um, and our postgraduate certificate students are required to have 540 clinical hours. And then our DNP students um, have to have 360 clinical hours. Um, the clinical hours uh, vary. And when you come to, uh, if admitted again, when you come to Clinical Bound, we talk about this uh, extensively. Um, we also allow our students to do some of their clinical hours via telehealth experiences. Um, and, uh, and we have specific rotations um, that our students must complete as part of the clinical portion of the program. Because again, we're across the lifespan program. And I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear earlier, but, but we treat from, you know, from, from young child all the way up through older adult. And, and so it doesn't necessarily mean you have to work with uh, all those populations, but you're going to be prepared uh, to, work with, to work with all those populations. And we also have a minimum number of clinical hours per week or hours that you have to be in clinic per week. Uh, the first uh, several terms, first two terms, of, of clinical, you have to be in clinical 20 hours a week uh, minimum. And then, and then in the last uh, term, you have to be in clinical a minimum of 32 hours a week. And the reason why we do that is we want you to finish. We want you to get done um, and get, get those immersive clinical experiences without, you know, having, oh, I got five clinical hours here. I got five clinical hours here. Um, so that's why Frontier does require minimum uh, clinical hour uh, requirements. So that's something else to factor into your decision. Is, is that, you know, when you hit the clinical portion of the program, like I said, the first couple of terms, you're going to be doing at least 20 hours a week, uh, which, and then, and then, and then the last, um, you know, then the last term, you'll do 32 hours a week. So um, again, it takes about a minimum of 16 weeks. Uh, so four months to complete the MSN and about three and a half minimum of three and a half months or 14 weeks to complete the postgraduate certificate clinical hours. Okay. Again, the DNP clinical hours, those are separate. Uh, that's not part of our program, but we just put the DNP on here so you can get an idea of what that would look like after graduation if you decided to go into that particular specialty track. Okay. All right. Next slide. All right, so who are your people? Um, I think this is a great slide. Uh, so obviously there's me, I'm the department chair. I have a clinical director, Dr. April Phillips, who oversees, um, who, and she's right below me there, um, who oversees the clinical portion of our curriculum. Uh, we have our regional clinical faculty that again, oversee um, portions of our, or oversee your, your progress and, and, your, and support you in the clinical portion of the program. Um, we have uh, academic advisors and clinical advisors, our financial aid officers, our credentialing coordination team, um, and then we have our course coordinators and course faculty. So you have a very robust team to support you um, in our program. And I can't say this enough. If you're accepted in our program, we think you are going to be successful and we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that, that you are, uh, that we can assist you in achieving your educational goals. Um, our attrition rate is very, very low. Um, and a big part of the reason why is we don't give grades, obviously people have to earn it, uh, but we have, we just have a, a wonderful support system in place um, that'll help you all be successful. Um, unlike some other programs maybe that you've been to uh, where they, they stand up during orientation and say, look to your right, look to your left. Uh, those people won't be here uh, at the end of graduation or graduation. That's not our philosophy here. Again, if you're admitted to our program, then we think you can be successful. And we're going to do everything we can to support you uh, with achieving your educational goals. Okay. All right. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, our Versailles campus. 
Um, and so as you can see, um, the, up here on the top, on your top left, looking at the screen, that's one of our student lodges. Um, and then um, next to that is our president's house. And then this is our welcome center. Um, and, um, and then our dining, dining hall is, is in the middle. And this is the entrance to Frontier there on our, on our sign. We have a beautiful campus with walking trails. The food is phenomenal. Uh, lots of things to do. And, uh, and we really, look, really enjoy having students uh, on campus. And we try to make it as homey as possible. We have multiple fire pits. Um, and people make lifelong connections when they come to Frontier Bound. Uh, I hear students tell me all the time, I met one of my best friends at Frontier Bound, not came, not knowing anybody, uh, met, met one of their colleagues that was maybe in, a, in their specialty track or another specialty track and they became lifelong friends. And that's exactly what we're looking for in terms of our sense of community. Now you're gonna come to Frontier Bound and make a best friend, you know, oh, maybe, but it's not a requirement, all right? But it just, it, it, it speaks to, uh, again, our community and, and what we're about it at Frontier. And once you're a student of ours in my particular discipline, uh, you have a faculty coach and mentor for life after graduation. Um, you know, I get students that reach out to me all the time that I've had from, and I've been in a couple of different places, um, and, and I still have students from even other places that reach out to me um, asking for, uh, you know, professional uh, advice and those sorts of things. So that's another thing that makes our community unique. Okay, next slide. All right, and um, and one of the things I think we do a great job of is is promoting our students and what they uh, what they uh, accomplish. And um, so this is Caitlin Raglowski, and she uh, was our student award uh, leadership award winner uh, this past weekend at our graduation. And um, and and this is some of the things that that our students are doing. Uh, you know, in in really establishing the credibility of psychiatric nurse practitioners in their underserved communities. Um, she developed screening and support programs to, to families in, um, in neonatal intensive care units and provides them with local uh, resources and then gets them connected to the care um, that, that she needs. And one of the reasons why she chose uh, our university is just obviously because of our history, um, but our dedication with uh, underserved, working with underserved populations and the flexibility that we have with the online courses. And so uh, Kaylin's story is, is not a story of one. Uh, we have multiple students out there that are making a huge impact uh, in their communities. And in fact, uh, when you come to Frontier and you graduate, we believe that upon graduation, you're a gift to your community because you're going to bring uh, psychiatric mental health care to those who can't generally get it um, and providing it and, and, and having that positive impact on your community, whether it's your clinical care through volunteer work uh, or other things that you do to support your community. Uh, so again, something that's very, very important to us here at Frontier. Okay, next slide. All right, here's another, um, uh, another one of our alumni, Cody Pittman. Uh, he recently opened his own, own practice and telehealth practice. Actually, Cody reached out to me and we had some conversations about how to start a telehealth practice because I actually own a telehealth practice. Um, and so, um, you know, he, he uh, you can see his quote here, I truly believe that Frontier gave me well-rounded knowledge base that continues to allow me to advance my nurse practitioner knowledge. And, uh, and he's, he's doing great things in his community um, supporting uh, rural and underserved communities. Okay, next slide. All right, so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the group. You can either ask questions um, through the chat or you can, um, um, or you can um, uh, uh, ask questions to me directly by unmuting and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll start with one. Hi, uh, yep. thanks for your time today. This is exciting to hear about. Um, I've taken just a small number of online learning um, courses, and I think there's been some variation on sort of how those courses are set up. Um, so I'm wondering what the Frontier courses entail in terms of lecture time, um, you know, chat board discussions. Um, yeah, it, it, are you able to give me a little more of a sense of sure. what the courses, yeah, what they look like? Sure. So, um, so our courses, again, we believe in community. So this is not a death by discussion board program. It's not a self-taught program. Um, generally, what will happen is faculty will do pre-recorded lectures, and then they will host recorded, uh, you know, live sessions, uh, either during the week or, or at, at, at multiple 
multiple points during the, the term. Um, we generally don't have a lot of synchronous sessions. If we do have a synchronous session that you're required to be at, you're going to know well in advance to be able to, you know, request time off and that kind of stuff. When we do offer a synchronous session, it's not something that we just say, oh, there's one, you have to be there. If you don't show up, you fail. We offer multiple synchronous um, uh, sessions and uh, when, when we do those, but a lot of you're going to hear from your faculty every single week, whether they do, a, a, you know, again, it'll be a, you know, generally a, a pre recorded lecture. And then they may offer that week, they may offer um, a, a live session that's recorded that if you're not able to attend, you're able to go back and read, you know, or listen to it and, and see what the questions were asked and, you know, what information the faculty put out. Um, and then they, they post, uh, they post weekly announcements. So you hear from them every week, at least in a weekly announcement, like, hey, this week, we're covering this. And here's the things that you need to focus on. Um, and, and that kind of stuff. And so for example, um, I am uh, helping out in, in one of our mental health assessment courses or a mental health assessment course next term. And the first two weeks I'm doing, uh, I did pre recorded lectures, and I'm doing uh, uh, two live sessions the very first two weeks, because it's to me, that's very important because it's foundational um, in terms of learning the assessment skills to be a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And then we're, we're kind of looking at it on the weeks that maybe we have exams and, and or if there's other content that's like just totally seminal content that we need to have students, uh, you know, give them an opportunity to come and ask questions. But you can always ask questions. We do have discussion boards. We, we do have uh, email or the in, within our learning management system, the ability to ask questions of faculty. Um, we also have communications policy at Frontier, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and so if students all, everybody has to abide by the communications uh, um, policy. And that's if you get an email or from, a, from anybody that you respond within 72 business hours. Um, all of our faculty, I would say respond probably in some cases immediately and definitely within uh, 24 business hours. Um, but that's not something, again, you see at other places. So you're not going to go where, oh, I don't hear from faculty or that sort of stuff. Uh, everybody knows what that communication policy is and, and everybody adheres to it, which is, again, that's part of our culture of, of caring. So, um, so does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, I think that's really reassuring, especially to hear you say it's, you know, not a self taught program and that faculty is really available. Um, that was my fear that, you know, it'd be lots of reading assignments and discussion board, but um, you're left to your own devices. So that's really reassuring. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's not. And again, uh, so I'm, you know, I didn't tell this group about myself, but I'm retired military um, and a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And I was training um, my, uh, my team and I were training. Uh, all of the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners for the Department of Defense for over a five year period when I was in charge of the program. And our students had to be ready to go. And I bring that philosophy here. And I can't teach you, I can't, I can't help you have you self teach yourself. program. Um, and, and, and lastly, our goal is to prepare people for practice. I don't believe in entry level practice. When you graduate our program, you're going to be ready to go practice. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, I, I saw a question on the chat real quick. Uh, if I work Monday through Friday, is this doable? Absolutely, it is. It's doable. You just have to dedicate, you know, the time and and uh, and and manage your time. Um, our courses are built in modules, so every week there's a module, and our modules open on Sunday and they close on Saturday night at eleven fifty nine p.m. So it's just a matter, of, you know, it's a matter of you managing your schedules and um, through. Um, you know what the requirements are for courses. The nice thing about our learning management system is at the very beginning of our courses, um, there's calendars in there that you can uh, that you'll have access to uh, that will put all your assignments on it. So you can kind of get a snapshot of what the term looks like, so that you can um, you know kind of manage your time uh, that way. Uh, for clinical hours, it's much more difficult to to work Monday through Friday eight to five because of our clinical hour requirement. So we do find that people uh, either take time off during that or um, you know, we, we have, we, we do have a few students that have found weekend clinical rotations, uh, but those, those are fewer and far between in terms of, of, of psych mental health. So, uh, definitely something, um, um, you know, that, that, that starts, um, let's see, before I take another question from the discussion board, uh, anybody else that on the live lecture here on the, that's popped up that wants to ask a question? Yeah, go for it. I have a question. Um, my name is Hannah, and I actually did Frontiers um, program for women's health um, nurse Great. practitioner. So, um, and so I'm curious, just the timing between acceptance and uh, Frontier bound is you know pretty short turnaround. So I'm wondering 
if that's not feasible, you know, some of us just, you know, it's, it's not that easy to get out of sort of current work commitments for sure. that. Do people like delay their entrance because of that ever? Yeah, they, we, we do have some folks that defer um, right now because you're right, because we're coming up on the, um, uh, when you're coming up on the, um, uh, you know, deadline, it's a little bit more difficult because yeah, we start frontier bound in like less than, in like two months, less than two mm -hmm. months. Um, we run about four to five frontier bounds a term. So you might be better off applying for spring because we do rolling admissions. We don't wait until the end to give you your admissions letter. If you, if you apply and you're one of the first groups for spring term, you should hear, you know, within, within several weeks of your application, if your application is complete, um, because our admissions committee generally meets, uh, they, they sort of meet, they, they sort of meet ad hoc, you know, as we say, oh, we've got this many students that are here, we're going to go ahead and have an admissions committee meeting. So I would encourage you, if you're in that position where you're kind of pushing up to, to start dates, to, to consider spring term and applying early on for spring term, because then you'll have more time to prep for frontier bound. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, one of the uh, one of the questions um, on the chat was clinical start and clinical coursework. Um, we do not allow students to do clinical coursework at the same time they're doing didactic. It doesn't make sense. And the reason why it doesn't make sense is because we need preceptor. We need our students to go in and be able to see a patient from beginning to end. Um, and and if we didn't have that, our preceptors wouldn't take students because they don't they don't have the time to teach. Um, you know, a, a lot of the skills for somebody that's an extreme novice that hasn't had um, psychopharmacology and that hasn't had psychotherapy. So you have to do, uh, that's why we do our didactic portion first, you come to clinical mount and then you start your clinical rotations. And it's, psych is different. It's just different than some of the other uh, programs. And I understand that there are programs out there that are structured like that. And I will tell you, they're generally not quality programs. Um, because how can you become an expert on something uh, when you're just learning it and you don't have much opportunity to apply it? I mean, it'd be like going to clinical with, uh, with uh, me at the, you know, the, if I haven't taken, if I'm in psychopharm and I haven't had the antidepressants and I see a patient that's suppressed, I tell my preceptor, I can't do the plan for this because we haven't had it in, in, in class yet. So uh, to avoid that, that's why we do uh, uh, clinical rotations at the end of the, or the way we have it structured. You get the didactic portion first, you come, you get an opportunity to practice, apply what you've learned in a controlled environment. We sign off for you to go to clinical, and then you're ready to, to start your clinical rotations. Um, we don't allow clinic. We do not allow um, uh, any clinical hours to count towards our program. They have to be within the structure of the program, um, and that is a requirement from our national certifying body. We have no way around that. Um, yes, clinical sorry. starts. I had one question. If sure. I could interrupt. Um, Sorry, Sabrina, I have my video off. Um, I was curious if you did have, for example, like one week of conflict where you had something planned, is it possible to work ahead in um, the coursework if you try to arrange that with teachers or you can only open the module for the week and you can only work on that week's work? Yeah, so if there's something that comes up that's going to impact your ability to complete coursework, it really is up to the course coordinator. Um, and so our course coordinators have flexibility i would say in general what they would probably would do is give you an extension uh to complete um you know to complete whatever it was um that for that particular week but we they, they you know it's really again it's up to the course coordinator um with whether or not they're going to allow you to to uh to work ahead um part of the reason why we don't allow folks to work ahead is because um you know if, if we we want to we want to maintain that sense of community and that sense of um continuity throughout the course and if people are working three or four weeks ahead um, we can't we can't have that that natural dialogue that would occur um, you know if we had everybody on the same you know same page in terms of the learning and again that's just a it's a learning pedagogy that is uh, tried and true in terms of um, you know we want to keep everybody on the same pace in terms of their learning so that uh, folks can get the maximum benefit of the content for those particular weeks but again if you have any issues don't worry um, reach out to your course coordinators and we can um, you know we can go from there in terms of you know any special requirements we also understand life happens you know if there's things that are going to impact your ability to complete coursework 
um, you know, reaching out to your course coordinators, uh, like I said, for assignment extensions and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is um, if there's something that's going to impact your work to complete the term or a semester, uh, please reach out, you know, to your department chairs, in this case, me and your academic advisors, because we have options in place, um, you know, for people to take time off from school if they need to. Um, and again, that's not something that you see a lot of other places. Okay. Um, Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, clinicals, um, um, you know, can take, like I said, anywhere from minimum of 16 weeks, so four to six months for MSN students. Uh, generally, um, you know, when you look at our overall curriculum structure, um, you have to take primary care courses, the MSN students do, uh, which are rel which are germane to all nurse practitioners and midwives. Um, and then you start into our management courses, which are the specialty courses. Um, but yeah, our clinicals, um, you know, generally take a minimum of four months uh, to complete for our MSN students and a minimum of about two and a half or three and a half months for our, um, for our postgraduate certificate students. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. I'm um, from underserved California. And um, I have two questions. Um, I'm on a university calendar, so I actually get um, eight weeks off in the summer, which is wonderful. But um, I'm wondering if it's possible to do more clinical time during that, that time and then catch up on my coursework later because that's uh, I have the flexibility to do that. But like many people, I do work full time at other parts of the year. Yeah, so we can tailor your clinical rotations. So, you know, in fact, I have students that do that. Like some of them find like, oh, I can do 40 hours a week. And they're in, you know, they're in a, they have to do a minimum of 20, but they can do 40 and we let them do that. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know, uh, up to you sharing that with your clinical faculty person um, and, and negotiating, you know, your, your clinical rotations with them. And we see that. We see folks that, you know, I also see people like, hey, my kids are out of school for the summer. I'm going to take the summer term off and come back in fall term, you know. So we see that as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we do flexibility with the number of clinical hours per week. Um, my second question is about the clinical placements. You know, I think that's a high source of anxiety for anybody going into a graduate or postgrad program, um, especially being so far away. Um, not knowing what the resources will be in any given area, um, you know, and I know you you have you have a map, a community map, but it, it in some ways it seems a big a big jump, a, a leap of faith to apply to a program without knowing the the resources of any given community for your clinical placements. I I know you may not be able to shed a lot of light on that, but okay. for me that's a that's a concern for you know, applying cross country or something like that. So I can, and I'm going to, I'm going to speak to it and then I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to give Jamie an opportunity to talk to that as well. So I, I probably wasn't as clear as I could have been with the regional clinical faculty. These are clinical faculty that are, that work in the regions of the country and they're all over the country. So like I have folks that are in, in um, Washington state and Idaho and, um, and Texas that help so that, that work in, that have students in California, for example, are familiar with the landscape, um, you know, and the specific requirements. California is a tough state. I mean, it, Oregon's a tough state. Uh, but the cool thing is we've maintained our accreditation with those boards of nursing uh, to be able to practice because of our relationships that we had um, with, um, with uh, clinical placement sites in those, in those areas. And I, I honestly, I have very, very few students that don't graduate this program because of clinical placement issues. Um, and so the other thing that we have the opportunity to do, let's say that you're struggling to find a substance abuse rotation, for example, or substance use disorder. Um, we, we have a clinical partnership in Colorado. Now you gotta pay for it, you're gonna have to go there, but, but we can get you there and, and we can get you clinical placement to get those hours in. And so our faculty and our clinical placement team and our um, work tirelessly to make sure that students are supported. So I'm sorry that I wasn't clear about the regional clinical faculty um, component of it. But again, most of our students, I would tell you a lot of our students, our biggest admissions are, um, are Oregon, 
um, Arizona, um, Kentucky's kind of falling off. Florida's pretty big. Washington's pretty big. California's kind of in the middle. Um, but we do have, you know, again, we have clinical faculty that are very familiar with that. And also our clinical director, Dr. Phillips, um, worked for a program in California. So she's a very familiar with clinical site placement for site uh, in, in California as well. Great. Thank you very much. Of course, Jamie. Yes, I was going to add, um, so we, we touched on our community map. You are not limited to the community, community map. The bottom line is if a site wants to take you on, credentialing can make it happen. Um, so places like the VA may be a possibility for you. We have lots of students interested in correctional facilities. So start thinking about who you know. Um, Dr. Hale Callahan mentioned a good point. You do have to be flexible. I think there's always a clinical site out there, but you may have to be willing to travel for it. Um, you can do clinicals wherever you have a valid RN license or compact going to another compact is fine. And also the telehealth policy is quite generous. So keep those things in mind as well. And we will work with you one-on-one. -on -one. I think starting early, networking, getting your name out there. You can always work on your resume. You can always look into joining um, APNA. Um, see who you know. You can all look at the SAMHSA site. You can all look at the Psychology Today site right now to see who's in your area. But you are not bound by our own community map. Every single day, the credentialing department is adding um, brand new sites, and we're happy to do that if they want to take you on. The other question is, can you do clinical placement in your workplace? And, and so it really depends. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, if you're if your supervisor is going to be your preceptor, then no, that's not something that we allow conflict of interest. Uh, we don't allow people to work in family practice. I mean, in practices that are family owned, again, conflict of interest um, for us. But I, I have had people that work in the ER at one facility and they haven't done anything with psych other than transport patients to the psychiatric unit. And they can have they can work in those in their organization. Uh, with their, you know, with a preceptor in that area. So um, generally, it 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 it, um, it only, um, you know, it's, it's it's situational. We have to take a look at it. But again, that's what your your uh, clinical faculty member for is for, and also your clinical advisor to ask those questions ahead of time. All right, so we're getting towards the end here. Any other questions? Last minute questions from the group. Uh, Dr. Callahan, I don't know if we have any students on from Oregon, but maybe you could just touch on the Oregon um, PMHNPs and MDDOs, just that they, they can't use the LCSWs. Yeah, so um, in some states, we allow, uh, they allow us, our students to use um, non-prescribed prescribing psychiatric faculty or um, non-prescribing behavioral health providers as preceptors. So child psychologists, psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, licensed uh, mental health counselors, uh, but it's really state dependent. You can't do a lot of hours with them because, um, you know, you're, you're here to learn psychiatry. Um, but then, um, but then um, um, we, but then you, you um, you know, but then you you can do some of them, but there are some states where they don't allow preceptors uh, of those particular disciplines. So it has to be with a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, clinical psychologist, or uh, psychiatrist. Um, so again, if you're applying for clinical placement, thinking about those, those are all things that um, that that you you know we're we're here to support you. We're not going to let you fall into a you know trap where you're getting oh I have this preceptor and and, and that kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, so we have five clinical courses. Clinical courses vary um, in terms of when people complete those. A lot of times people will complete uh, once they hit the last clinical course, which is uh, or the last clinical section, uh, that's when they have to complete the 30 hours a week uh, minimum for that last clinical section. Um, and so, um, um, yep, yeah, we have several other that are limited to psych NPs and in those states and some of those states as well. So thanks, Jamie. So some, some other things to kind of consider. New York, we are not accepting new students for psych mental health nurse practitioner at this point. New York is not accepting any new um, universities uh, to be certified. We are certified in New York as a midwifery program, but they're not taking any specialty tracks at this point. Um, so if you're a student in New York, um, you would not be eligible for our program unless you're going to go do clinical placements in uh, surrounding states. 
So, um, but any of those sorts of things, you know, if you have questions, um, you know, your missions counselors can help out with that uh, up front, you know, about, hey, am I eligible? What's, you know, is there anything that I need to, you know, think about in terms of, you know, considering applications, okay? All right. Well, thank you all very, very much for your time. Uh, I have time for one question and then and then we'll wrap up. I guess I had a question about the type of therapy. I saw that you focus on CBT. Are there other kind of therapy options to <laughs> focus on? Or is that was that just a misread or it's a misread? Uh, I don't okay. know where that information is at. Okay. Um, and I apologize for that, but we, we, you're not, the psychotherapy that you're going to focus on is we're going to expose you to a lot of different psychotherapeutic modalities. You're not going to be a master of any of them because we don't have the time. Um, but we're going to expose you to a lot of psychotherapy techniques. Um, and the reason why is, is many nurse practitioners, um, um, use multiple different psychotherapeutic modalities. The other thing is I'm not going to prescribe a psychotherapeutic modality and say, my program is doing this. And here's the reason why, because it may not be philosophically congruent with who you are professionally. Mm -hmm. So um, I just don't, we don't do that, but we're going to expose you to a lot of different psychotherapeutic modalities that you are going to be able to leverage in clinical practice. Now, if you want to become an expert in one, uh, those things are done postgraduate because there's clinical supervision and things that are, um, you know, things that are, um, uh, there as well. And then uh, in terms of salary, salaries um, are, we, we, we do pretty well. Um, American Psychiatric Nurse Association has some salaries out there for you. Um, and, and I would say, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, a six figure income is easily attainable upon graduation. And then as you have more experience, you kind of go up from there. Uh, it just really depends on the environment and settings that you're working in. Um, one of the things that I tell our students is not to not to undervalue yourself um, in terms of what your worth is, because there's there's there is a, a, a shortage of psychiatric prescribing providers that can treat across the lifespan in this country. And so uh, you were all you know, you were all definitely if you're you know, once you complete this program, you're definitely a, an asset. So um, A and P, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners website also has salary information that's regional um, to give you an idea of, of kind of what the salaries are. But generally speaking, um, you know, starting off, we're doing better than our nurse anesthesia colleagues that, that graduate in terms of salary. So um, uh, that, that, that should hopefully maybe give you some, you know, a little bit of uh, insight into what our salaries are. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate uh, your attendance today. Um, if you have questions about the admissions process, please don't hesitate to reach out to the admissions um, counselors. Uh, really, any questions about the, the program, um, the admissions counselors are your first point of contact, and then they can uh, get you connected with, uh, with the right person. So I uh, hope you all have a great evening. Thank you to my team for putting this together. Greatly appreciate your support in this, and, uh, and have a great night, everybody. Take care.